There are many activities that define summer. Summer is defined by barbecues, like that co-ed barbecue we're going to have soon. Right, Sean? <laughs> Man, you need to show up for that thing. Man, the ladies showed up big time. We have barbecues that define summer. We have swim parties, right? Pool parties that define summer. We have road trips. Any road trippers out there that define summer? Perhaps the most pleasurable and equally painful activity of summer is camping. Anybody with me? Camping. God bless camping. I don't know why we torture ourselves by taking young kids camping. Anybody with me? You have this single life, this young married life where you can go camping without trouble. And you think it's going to look like this. But then you have kids and this is what it really looks like. Do we have that tent picture? You know what I'm talking about? You bring that tent from the 1980s with those rusted poles. And you are dedicated to get that thing up with no success. See, camping, we bring everything from our house and we buy things that we use one time for camping. We know this. You buy all that instant food that you'll never use and it goes in your bomb shelter, right? That old Y2K season. That's what we do in camping. But finally, you get there and you set up that campsite. And it's all the mess as you go and live in dirt for three days. Finally, the magic happens, right? Memories are being made on those camping trips and you go fishing and you make hot dogs and you have bad pancakes. That's the definition of camping. But perhaps the most special place in camping is around the campfire. You can remember back when you were young and around that campfire, memories were made and s'mores were made. See, s'mores take a technique. If you've ever watched The Sandlot, they have the best description of how s'mores are actually made. But there's skill to s'mores. But around that campfire, you, you will find, I don't know what it is about men, you can be with them all day and they will share nothing about, your life, about their lives. You get around a campfire, everybody opens up. Right? That's actually when, I don't know what it is. You can be talking to somebody that will not even give you a word. That fire comes, they start looking at it and they spill their whole life. It's the power of a campfire. It was a Tuesday night right before the heat of summer. I had a couple college students over to my house. We just wanted to connect. Men I mentored back when uh, they were young and in high school. And we just want to catch up as the summer was happening, hear how school was, hear how work was. And it was one of those magic nights where my kids went to bed early. Thank you, Jesus. And they were all asleep by 8 o'clock. And it was a gorgeous, glorious day. <laughs> the guys come over. We eat some awesome food. And of course, you have to bring out the fire pit put the fire pit out, and Aaron Dolce's there, Dylan Gove, Logan Hasty, and we're sitting around this fire, and as we're there, we just start opening up, sharing about our lives, and Logan sets the mood by putting some music on. He puts his phone out there, and we're listening to music, and we're just talking about our lives, and how young marriage life is, and things of that nature. Well, as we're there, I hear this ringing sound. I'm like, is that the music? And it gets a little louder. I said, you guys hear that? He said, oh, it's just the phone. I hear it again, and it's inconsistent. So I think it's coming from the house. So I walk from the fire pit on the side of the house over, and I see my kitchen, and there are flames from the floor to the ceiling. The kitchen is on fire. I say, the house is on fire. Run and get the kids. And I don't know what it is about those crisis moments. All you can replay is things you've seen in movies. You ever do this? So I run over to the kitchen doors, and I touch the knob. And I pull my full backdraft moment. I, I open the door and I kick the door open, right? I, I did not need to kick the door at all. But I run in. I had just been through this fire safety course for our adoption. So I run in the house. I'm like, go and get the kids. Take them outside. And I'm starting to look around. And there's flames coming from the dishwasher. And they are up to the roof. No exaggeration. So I'm looking for my extinguisher. And I realize it's underneath the sink right next to the dishwasher. So I take this towel and I'm fighting flames, right? <laughs> Fight these flames back grab the extinguisher, and I put that fire out. I was a hero, my friends. I saved the house. Run outside, fire department comes, and there is just green, black, toxic smoke all throughout the house. Fire department comes in. We have an amazing fire department here in Roseville. As they come in, they, they get their fans, and they open up all the windows. They're blowing all the smoke out. And you never want to waste an opportunity to build new relationships. So they're there, and I say, hey, I know you guys probably had a long night. I have made the best lemonade you'll ever have in your life. Would you like some? I said, of course. So we start sitting down, get all their names. 
and other stories down the road that, that developed from that. But as we were there sitting, he said, you sure are lucky. So why is that? He said, those fires burn so hot and are so toxic. When all those toxins come out, if you guys were asleep, you would not have woken up. So I was like, man, by God's grace, you were outside late night. It's a tired parent. I would have been in bed. So everybody was fine. But the next day, after everything was cleared out, then I saw the effects of the fire. See, the next day, the fire hit that kitchen, small area, but the whole house was impacted. The whole house was impacted. Let me just say this, a side note. And the whole house needed an upgrade because of that fire. And that fire paid for that upgrade, side note. But that fire impacted the house. There was smoke damage everywhere. There was soot everywhere. It changed everything. You see, there are many symbols that are used to describe God all throughout the Old and New Testament. We have God as the rock. We have God as wind in John chapter 3. We have God shows up in the cloud in Exodus. We then have him as the lion. We then have him as the lamb. However, the author of Hebrews chooses a symbol that's not often referenced throughout the Old and New Testament. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25 says, See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, for our God is an all-consuming fire. See, we like fire when we're in control of it. See, we use fire for cooking, we use fire for heat, we use fire for light. But when a fire is out of control, we get nervous. Why? Because it impacts everything around it. See, we as Californians are well aware of wildfires. We're familiar with wildfires because those are the fires that we can't control. And I, I think for a lot of us, when we think about God being a fire, we think of this small fire in a fireplace. That's not what the author of Hebrews is writing about. Not at all. It's not this small little quaint fire that's cozy. It is a consuming fire. See, the Dixie fire that took place was so significant. One of the biggest fires that we had witnessed the uh, scientists write about this one. They say, fire updrafts rapidly, pushing heat upwards, funneling smoke like a chimney to form clouds as the air cooled, giving the fire its own weather system. See, wildfires that burn so hot, they literally create their own weather system. It goes on to say, towering anvil-shaped clouds reaching almost eight miles high formed over the fire with lightning strikes, thunder, and strong winds occurring in these clouds, similar to the way a volcano erupts. This is the tornado fire that we released there. It's all from the fire. See, these wildfires that you can't contain, they consume everything. And when the author of Hebrews is writing, this is the, this is the description he's giving. He's actually quoting for Deuteronomy chapter 4. And see, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, they're talking about this significant event where God meets Moses on the mountain before all of Israel. And this is what he writes in Hebrew. It says, Behold, our God is a all-consuming fire, a devouring fire, a jealous God. See, that's the picture he used to describe God, and then he gives him a quality that we often shy away from and don't understand. You see, when we hear the term jealous, we're uncomfortable with it because there's two usages for jealous. We have jealous, again, the English language is crazy. It has all these different languages involved. Jealous comes from France. It's a French word that means envy and suspicion. But however, there's a Latin term for jealous, which means to be zealous for someone to be focused, to be unyielding. And the term that's used here in Hebrew and Greek is this, this type of jealousy. A jealousy that tolerates no unfaithfulness. You capture that? The jealousy of God, the fire of God for you is one that tolerates no unfaithfulness. We have a covenant-keeping God. Let me tell you this. He's not interested in a casual covenant. He's not interested in a covenant that's on your terms. God's not interested in an open marriage. He wants a covenant that tolerates no unfaithfulness. Why? Because his fire consumes everything and you're not in control of it. You're not in control of this fire is what the author of Deuteronomy is speaking about. See, this day that he's marketing, he recounts this in Deuteronomy chapter 4. He's saying, don't forget this. The author, he, author of Hebrews says, don't forget this. Why is it significant? See, in Exodus 19, 
And seven weeks after they've been delivered from Egypt, they were in slavery for so long, over 200 years, they're finally set free. And they see signs, wonders, and miracles. They have the Passover, but now they're stuck in the desert. Anybody with me? You feel stuck in the desert. They're stuck in the desert. There's no water. There's no resources. And they tell Moses, God better speak to us and tell us where we're going or you're dead. There's murmuring. There's complaining. They're frustrated at what's taking place. So Moses goes and he seeks Yahweh. And Yahweh says this, I'm going to meet you on the mountain. Now Moses does not know what to expect. As Sean shared, he met God in a desert with a small fire on a bush. That was just a foreshadowing of what takes place. And he goes and he tells the people, he says, consecrate yourselves. And Yahweh says, create a barrier around this mountain. No one can touch the mountain. If they touch the mountain, they'll die. So he goes and prepares them. Then the day comes. And what happens? It says, smoke descends upon the mountain and envelops the entire mountain. Fire and thunder, just like one of those wildfires, breaks out and consumes the mountain, and Moses goes into the smoke, into the presence of God. They hear his voice thunder. They hear these trumpet sounds. This is an event that no one could describe very well because it's nothing you've ever seen before. And on that day, Moses receives the law. He's given the Ten Commandments. He's given the illustration for the temple and the tabernacle. A significant day happens. And what's this day called? Pentecost. That's the day. It's 50 days after Passover. This is a celebration that's so significant, they also combine it with the festival of first fruits. And the festival of first fruits is when you would bring all your first fruits to celebrate, get this imagery, the harvest, okay? So you celebrate the harvest, and it says in Leviticus, which we won't have time to go through right now. We can throw it up on the screen. It says this, when you present your offering on the festival of first fruits, the Pentecost, how do you present that offering? It's an offering by fire. Why? Because that fire is a pleasing aroma to the Lord. On that mountain, Moses has also revealed this pattern for something called the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle was a tent. Here's a modern recreation of what the tabernacle would have looked like. And this tabernacle, this was the place where God's presence would rest. They had the Ark of the Covenant there. And the responsibility of the priest was this, was to keep the fire lit on the altar. The commandment was to keep the fire lit at all time. It was the stewardship of the priest to make sure that that fire did not go out because that was the holy place. That was the sacred place. That was the representation of God's power and presence. So as he stewards this fire, there's this curtain that separates the fire, the power of God's presence from the people. We then see this recreated in the temple, the structure, the long-going structure they would keep. You see, the tabernacle would move with Israel wherever it was. The temple would be a permanent place where they believed that God's presence, heaven, overlapped and interlocked with earth, N.T. Wright says. So this term, tabernacle, tent, temple. See, John the Apostle is very specific in how he writes his gospel. All the Gospels are intentional, but you'll notice Matthew, Mark, Luke, all similar. They're called synoptic Gospels. John's Gospel is very different. In John 1, he uses lots of varying language, and he describes Jesus as the Word, the Logos of God. Very technical term. It would take us a long time to explain that. That's a seminar worth studying. But from this, he uses a unique word to describe Jesus, the Word, coming to earth. John 1, 14, what does he say? It says, behold, and the word came and dwelt among us in flesh, full of grace and truth, right? We get this. Now, in a casual reading, we go by this and move on to other verses. However, John, being very intentional, uses a word that would catch any Hebrew's eye. He uses the word skinny, not skinny. Get your mind off your diets. That's not what we're talking about right now. Skinny. Meaning this, tabernacle or tent. Capture that? It says, behold, the word came. Let's reread this. The word came and dwelt, tabernacled among us. 
The living representation of God's presence was moving among Israel once again. The fire of the Holy Spirit and the power and presence of Yahweh that showed up on that Mount Sinai, that walked with them through the desert, is now among us again. He's moving in power and presence. We find this in John chapter 2. He says, tear this temple down, this tabernacle down. Three days what? I'll build it up again, right? So we have this temple language where he's the living representation of God's presence. But what does John the Baptist say? He says, behold, one who is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. See, this is not the casual fire we are aware of and normally know in our culture. It's the fire of the altar of the holy place. That's what he is referencing. And it's all consuming. Baptize you in fire. Significant moment happens. Jesus is crucified. At that moment of crucifixion, an odd note is made in Matthew. It says, upon the crucifixion, when Jesus died, what happened? An earthquake takes place. And the curtain of the temple is torn. Why is that significant? The temple curtain was that which separated the holy place, the altar of fire from the people. Now that curtain's torn, irreparable. It can't be restored. And what does Jesus give in Luke 24? He gives a promise and says, Behold, I'm sending you the promise of the Father. Wait in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. What is that echoing? What happened to that mountain? It was clothed in the presence of Yahweh. They go up to this mansion. It literally is. There's a couple mansions they've uncovered in Jerusalem. They would hold between one to 200 people. Some believer, some disciple has a large home they meet in. And for 10 days, they're committed to prayer and fasting. As they pray, Acts 2, 1, and on what day? The day of Pentecost. The day of the offering of the first fruits of the harvest. The day that they would offer a sacrifice in fire. Jesus, the high priest, offers his ecclesia, his church, to be that which is consumed with that fire. And just like that mountain, when the wind came and the rain fell and the thunder erupted, that same fire meets that room and does not meet in a temporal space, not a place that's separated by a curtain. You are now God's mountain. You are now God's temple. You are now the tabernacle dwelling among the earth. They're so overwhelmed by this, these tongues of fire erupt. They walk out and they start speaking other languages. Term there's Glossa, where all these people from all the nations that arrived for this festival, it's one of the pilgrimage festivals, they're there, and they're declaring the wonders of God in their own language, these Galileans. No one had seen anything like this. And here's a key phrase in verse 5. It says, those that saw were bewildered by this. What does that mean? They have no freaking clue what's happening. Verse 4, chapter 2 says what? They are filled to the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Not a temporal feeling, not a partial feeling. The full expression of God's Spirit, as in the temple, is now on them. And let me tell you this, as Sean shared earlier, when the fire of God is alive in your life, the world won't understand it. And what we have to understand is this. The religious spirit will come against the fire in your life, that religious spirit will come against that fire in your life and tell you it isn't God. And tell you that you have to be in control. But you can't control a fire that's all consuming. And our goal as believers in the modern day is to steward the fire of the altar like those priests in Leviticus 6. That we would steward the fire of the altar of our heart and we would live as those that are consumed by that all-consuming fire. But how do we do that? We believe that God is going to pour out His Spirit in a significant way, as He already has. We believe there's a coming revival, a move. And my friend Kathy is going to briefly share on how God is moving today. Would you welcome Kathy Fry? Hey, 
Hey, you all. So um, I just wanted to share a little bit. You know, Brandon talked about the fire and the baptism of fire. And um, I grew up not ever actually even hearing those words. I um, grew up in a very conservative church. And I didn't know that there was the baptism of fire. I received Christ as my Savior when I was six years old. And I thought that I had received everything that the Lord wanted to give me. But here's the reality. I was not experiencing the things that are written in this book. I was not experiencing the things that the disciples were experiencing once the baptism of fire hit them. At age 40, and I know some of you are shocked by that because you think that I'm under 40 now, but I'm not. At the age of 40, and bless you for thinking that I'm under 40. You're my best friend now. So at the age of 40, I had been walking with the Lord for 36 years, and I had a desperation in my heart. Lord, I think I know you, but there's something missing in my life, and I don't know what that is. And so the Lord began to take me on a journey just from that simple prayer of, Lord, whatever you need to do in my life, do it, because I need more of you. I don't feel like I have enough of you. The things that are in the Bible, I am not experiencing in my own life. I am experiencing a lot of Bible studies, and those are really good, but I am not experiencing what I read about in your scripture. A couple of months after that, my very dear friend Joanne got healed. Many of you have heard her healing testimony. The Lord was bringing that healing. He was bringing his spirit in closer. And I thought, wow, that's incredible. She experienced God in such a magnificent way. Good for her. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. But there was still this desperation deepening. Lord, I know that if you touched her, you can touch me. Don't leave me out. So the next thing that happened was Joe was actually speaking here. She was sharing her testimony that morning. And I have no idea why Joe asked me to be part of her prayer team because I didn't even believe in half of the stuff that we were doing. But I was here with her. And I had brought my eight-year-old son. He's now about to turn 18. That was 10 years ago. And our youngest son was having a hip issue, and he was sitting right down there. And at the end of the service, Joe released words. And none of the words were what Jake needed prayer for. But after she released words and her prayer team came up, she looked at me and she saw Jake, our son, our eight-year-old, and she asked, what does he need? And I said, he, he needs prayer. So Jake came hobbling up. He had this hip condition, and it made it hard for him to walk, and it took away the things that he loved, which was basketball. And with Jake standing right down here, right here, 10 years ago, Joe began to pray for him, and something happened to Jake in that moment that scared me to death. <laughs> that was the Holy Spirit encountered my son, my eight-year-old son. He fell down to the floor, and the look on his face, I thought, oh my goodness, what did she just do to my son? He's laying on the floor, and the face looked like fear. And so I knelt down, and I said, are you okay? What's happening? And he said, I'd like to know what that feeling is going through my body. And I looked at Joe sitting on the floor, and I said, what's that feeling going through his body right now? And Joe said, well, ask him. And he said, it feels like fire, and it feels like electricity. I didn't know what to do with that. I had never experienced that, and yet my eight-year-old is right here on the floor experiencing that. After that moment and after Jake experienced that, what happened to him was he got up here on the stage and he started jumping off. Very irreverent of him. <laughs> he shook for four days after we left out here. He began praying for people, and they began encountering the Lord. And they began encountering his healing. And me, 
as a daughter who doesn't want to be left out. I was like, yeah, Lord, that's amazing. Thank you so much for touching my son. But I, I want more. If you can touch Joe and you can touch Jake, certainly you can touch me. So Joe, if you know her, being Joe, she called me and she invited me to the conference that she had experienced her healing. And I thought, ooh, I don't know about that one. Those people are a little weird. <laughs> so I took a tour in our backyard and I walked around our pool while I was deciding whether or not I was actually gonna go to that conference because I knew what happened to her at that conference. And yet that deep desire in my heart was, Lord, you know that I've been praying to experience more of you. You know that deep cry. You know that if I don't have more of you, I'm done. I feel like I've done everything I can for you in my own power. So I said yes. It was shaking and trembling. I said yes. When I got to that conference in Florida, the first moment I walked in, I thought, these people are whack. They are strange. They are not my people. I should get on the first flight out of here, back home. What did I do? I left the conference. I'm being honest. I left, and I went back to the place that I was staying, and I tried to take a nap and sleep it all away. But the Lord woke me up, and, and I couldn't sleep. And I was like, I don't know what to do, Lord. And he said, you need to remove everything that is standing in the way of me encountering you. I didn't know how to do that. I hadn't been taught that. All I simply knew was I'm fearful and I'm religious. Not the good religious. And so I laid in my bed and I prayed, Lord, I break all of that off of me. Get rid of it. I don't want it anymore. It can't go where we're going. And so I went back to the conference and that night, the Lord began to move closer and closer to me. And that night, the worship began to happen, and I thought, these people are all singing a song that isn't even on, it's not even on the screen. I have no idea what they're doing. I don't know how they're all hearing the same thing, because it's not up there. And I didn't know what to do with it, but all I did was I separated myself from all of the group that I went with. And I was like, Lord, if you're going to touch me, it has to be you and me. It can't be manipulated. It can't be somebody hitting me, somebody moving me. It has to be you because what I want is you. I want a touch from you because I've seen what it does. I've seen what it does to my friends. I see what it did in the Bible. And in that moment, as I was standing away and I began singing the only song I know that doesn't have words, I surrender. I surrender all, all to Jesus. I surrender. And I began to sing, and what happened in that moment was something came, not a person, something came and lifted my feet up off the floor and threw my chest back, and I flew back five feet, and I began weeping because I'd never been touched like that ever in my life. And I thought, if this is my heavenly Father and he can touch me in this way, why wouldn't I be sold out for him? Later in the week, as it progressed, the last day, Randy Clark, and if you're familiar with Randy, he is such a sweet man. He is standing on the stage, and he begins to say, the Holy Spirit is moving in the room right now. And as he moves on you, I want you to come up here. And I thought, well, how would anyone know that he's moving? And he says, if you are shaking, if you are weeping, if the Lord is beginning to stir in you, I want you to come up because I believe that the Lord is going to move on people who have never experienced the Holy Spirit 
in this way, never experienced a baptism of fire in their life. And so as I was standing there thinking, well, okay, let me do a little self-check or any of these things happening to me. I'm looking at my friends, Joe and Michelle. I'm like, hey, guys, um, my legs are shaking, and I cannot make them stop. And they, in their wisdom, knew, oh, my goodness, the Lord is moving on you. And so they took me up to the front, and there were only about three people because Randy had just started speaking. And I also, I want to just release his spirit that, that if the Lord is moving on you and if this is touching you in any way, that you would just come up here and that you would kneel or that you would stand and allow the Lord to minister to you. And I want to invite um, either the music to play or invite, thank you all. So I came and I stood and, and I just had my hands out. I, Lord, I don't care what you do to me. I don't care, but you can have all of me. I've lived for 40 years on my own, doing my own thing. I've lived for 40 years having this Christian walk look like something, and I'm done. And so in this moment when I'm standing there waiting, I don't even know what I'm waiting for. All I know is I need more of the Lord. I need everything that you want to give me. I want, I want that. And in that moment, when no one was around me, there was this force that came and it hit me and it sent me back flying 15 feet and a fire began going through me and it began refining me. All I could think was there were things that were coming to my mind. There were newspaper articles about our state being one of the highest trafficked states in our nation. The Lord was showing me marriage certificates that he is a restorer of marriages. There were things that he was giving me in that moment that I knew he said, do you want to be about my business? Because I'm putting this power in you, not so that you can go home and go back to normal, but so that you can be changed and forever moved by my spirit, nothing else. Lord, I don't want any other person I don't want any other spirit to move me only your spirit God and I want to share a word with you that I felt like the Lord gave me today he has something for Roseville he has something for California guys he is not done do you know that can you feel that This morning, the Lord began to speak to me about the Rock of Roseville. I heard the word imposter. The Lord is removing Christian imposters. And can I share with you that I was one of them? and he is replacing it with his influencers. He is creating his influencers and here's what he says. Influencers come in three different ways. There's mega influencers, there's macro influencers, and there's micro influencers. And they cover entire society. Did you know that? He showed me that there are four angels that stand in this room the Rock of Roseville, they are commissioning and they are sending angels. They equip and they send those who raise their hand and those who say yes to everything that Jesus wants to do. The Lord said, I want you to look up what happened in Roseville in 1995. And I know that's weird, but that's how he speaks to me. In 1995, it was the largest ever recorded flood that happened in Roseville. The estimated flow at Vernon Street, at the point which the watershed was approximately 80 square miles in this area. 15,000 cubic feet per second. 
boats, not cars, were headed down flooded streets with four feet of water gushing down parts of Sunrise Avenue. The popular road resembled a fast moving river more than a street. Subsequent evaluations indicate that this was a hundred year flood in certain locations. More than 300 homes were damaged. But here's what it says, the biggest difference between this flood and ones that were previous was it came all at once. This flood came at once. It came overnight in a second. Everything had changed. Simultaneously, the Lord told me, I want you to look up what was happening in 1994 and 1995. I don't know if you know this, but simultaneously in 1994, there was the Toronto blessing. There was a revival breaking out in Canada. People from the United States were heading up there. They were being baptized with the fire of God and they were bringing it back. What happened in 1995 in Florida was revival broke out because there were ones who said, whatever you wanna give me, Lord, whatever you wanna give me, I will take it all. There were ones that had that desperation. Jesus, I cannot do this without you anymore. I cannot. The Lord said to me this morning, I want you to look up the square acres of Roseville, California. That's bizarre. Did you know that Roseville, the acreage of Roseville is 44 square miles? Did you have any idea? I didn't have any idea. Why would I need to know that? I didn't know that. And he said, I want you to look up Isaiah 4.4. The Lord washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and he purged the blood of Jerusalem from their midst. The spirit of judgment by the spirit of burning. Then the Lord said, I will create a dwelling place above her assemblies, a cloud by day and a shining flame by night. For all over, the glory will be their covering. They will be a tabernacle for shade in the day from the heat and a place for refuge in the storm and rain. And then he said, I want you to look up Isaiah 44, three and four. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. They will spring up from among the grass like willows by the water course. One will say, I am the Lord's. And another will call himself by the name of Jacob which means to follow. Another will write on his hand, the Lord's. And another will name himself by the name of Israel. God provides. The Lord's heart is for Roseville, California. Can you feel it? The Lord's heart is for California. The whole nation is saying they're lost. There's no hope. But our Father, can you see it? Can you hear it? Our Father is saying, I'm not done. I'm not done with California. I'm not done with Roseville. I don't know about you, but I have three kids. And what has happened to him, each one of them, what the enemy has taken from my kids, I am ready to say, I will get it back for you, Father God. No more will the enemy steal our children. No more will he be able to write what's on their lives because God, you have something better on their lives. I am telling you, our sons and daughters are being called back. Our sons and daughters will say, I, I am the Lord's. I will follow. Our sons and daughters will say, God has prevailed in me. The burning of the Lord is unquenchable and it is unstoppable. And I want you to stand right now
Jesus, we thank you for this day of Pentecost. And we thank you for everything that your disciples walked in. We thank you that because you were beside them, they were able to see and move in greater things. But Jesus, we thank you that you sent a helper. We thank you that when you encounter us with your fire, that we are unstoppable, that we are unquenchable. Thank you that you burn away the chaff in order to get down to business. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move in this place, that you would move, light up the ones who have actually experienced fire before, but they need a fresh touch of you. They need a fresh touch of your spirit. So Father God, would you release your burning? Would you release your fire? Father, the ones who have never experienced your burning, your fire before, would you fall on them? Would you begin to move? Because we know if you don't change us, we cannot do the works that you have called us to do. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move right now that you would begin to move on your children. I'm gonna invite you that if there is a burning in you that is beginning to take place, if there's a feeling that you've never felt before, I'm gonna invite you down to the front. We want to pray for you. If you are a leader for the Rock of Roseville, I want to invite you, hey. No leaders yet, unless you're coming down for the response. So leaders, just hold back. If you're going to pray for people, I really want this to be a response to the Lord first. And we're going to have leaders pray. If you are a leader in this house and you need that fresh touch, I want to invite you down here as well. So Holy Spirit, hey, we pray that you would come, that you would move in a mighty way. We freshly give you our hearts. I want to tell you there are revivals right now that are being birthed across our nation, across our nation. There are meetings that have begun in churches just like this one in tents, and they have no end. They are continuing to go. If you don't have a burning, hey, because it's been too long. Just lift up your hands right now. If you need a fresh anointing, even for him to just blow on the embers of your heart to remind you of him. If you see somebody's hand raised around you, would you touch them? And would you just bless what the Lord is doing? Bless them to experience more of him. He is not bound by time. It does not matter how old you are. You can be 97 and the Lord still has a work for you to do because you're still here. He's not bound by time. He wants to touch you.